So last time, at the end of my class, I was asked this question to explain yoga atma, that yoga is the middle part of the Vijnanamaya kosha, the intellectual layer. Because the way these five layers are perceived in the Upanishads, all of them because they, they are pervading, they are pervasive, they pervade every part of the body, they also have the shape of the human body. Pranas are all pervasive. When we will come to the word prana in this mantra, I will speak about them. Similarly, the mind, the intellect, everything pervades every part of the body and that's why it has the same shape. <coughs> but why is yoga the torso, the middle body of the Vidyanamaya Kosha, the intellect, the layer of the intellect, the masters have explained it in several ways. First of all, yoga as the word, whenever it is used in the Upanishads or in Patanjali himself, when he uses the word yoga, he uses it in the meaning of a concentrated state of mind, a meditative state of mind. He of course also uses the word yoga for anything that is a means, is an instrument, is a method to achieve it, to achieve that meditative state. And that's why devotion is bhakti yoga, knowledge is jnana yoga, karma action when performed with the intention of giving rise to that meditative state, it is called karma yoga. Or if one practices asana with that purpose in mind, then asana too becomes yoga. Pranayama too becomes yoga. Because yoga can mean both. It can mean an instrument to yoga and it can also mean the state of yoga as defined by Patanjali in the very beginning of the Yoga Sutras. So, When the Upanishadic masters, they say that yoga, this meditative state, is the torso of the intellect, of this capacity of understanding, what they mean is that yoga changes 
the practice of yoga, the practice of meditation, and all the angas, which means the limbs, yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, all these limbs, the practice of these limbs, refines the intellect in such a way, it becomes refined in such a way that its true potential, its real potential, comes to the forefront. And that is because of two things. The first reason is that the practice of yoga focuses the intellect, gives it a focus. So it's not, it's not lost in many things, but it completely, it acquires the training, the capacity to focus on one thing, to settle on one thing, to brood on one thing, to be in one thing and pierce that object into its depth. And that is the reason it put its potential, its energy, its power gets developed. It's very simple. It's just the way you, when you focus the rays through a lens, the power is already there, but simply because when it gets focused on one point, it becomes so powerful that it can set the paper or anything on which we are focusing those rays, it can set it alight. It starts burning. So the power comes. The power is already there, but it just gets focused. But usually the mind, and with that the intellect, because the intellect follows the mind, so because the mind is agitated, the intellect is also agitated because the mind jumps from one thought to another thought like a monkey with that the intellect is also forced to jump from one object to another object never giving it enough time to focus to be attentive to study something in great depth in great detail that is one thing that yoga the practice of yoga changes. The second thing is that because the senses are directed, are whatever we perceive through the senses are objects that lie in the world out there. With that, our attention, our mind, our thoughts, everything is always about something out there. Never about that which lies within. So our flow of consciousness is always outward, directed outward. And what yoga changes is that it, it's all about, even from the, very from the very fundament, foundational practice of asana, it's about pulling that attention back into oneself. So, <clears throat> These two radical changes come about through the practice of yoga after which the full potential of the intellect. Earlier it was bahirmukha, which means in Sanskrit that means facing outward. Mukha means face and bahirmukha means facing outward. Then what happens is that the, the intellect, the capacity, the faculty of understanding starts to face inward. So the word that is then used is antarmukha, antarmukha which means to be faced inward. This is a very, this, this idea is a, this idea of facing outward and facing inward is a very, very important idea in Sikhism. In Sikhism, just the word is slightly different. Uh, they use the word Manamukha. 
a person who is facing the mind and guru mukha a person who is facing the guru the supreme master the same universal master that patanjali speaks about the for them the word for that formless universal consciousness in sikhism the word is guru and exactly the same word that patanjali it's very rare in fact i think it's only sikhism and patanjali's yoga sutras which specifically use the word guru for that universal essence for that universal consciousness instead of using it for a particular human being the teacher the master all other traditions use the word guru in a personal sense but these two traditions use it for the universal principle so someone who is facing the guru or someone who is facing the mind they use these two words so initially as the intellect is now in the absence of the practice of yoga it is directed exclusively towards outer objects towards objects lying all around in the world and it is generally in a agitated state with the practice of yoga the opposite happens it changes its direction inward and it settles down it calms down which makes it possible for the intellect to focus to be attentive to be fully mindful of anything that it chooses as its objects and that is when it acquires the capacity to explore the subtleties abstract you can call them abstract ideas you can call them extremely subtle ideas that is when it it becomes capable of exploring the subtleties the abstract ideas in greater detail when it is settled when it is calm and that is why then the upanishadic masters they say that this consciousness which lies hidden within all beings but doesn't shine forth simply because a person remains unaware of it but when the buddhi when this faculty of understanding is focused and is rendered subtle when it becomes peaceful when it becomes shanta that's why <clears throat> then it starts to perceive the light with which it perceives everything rather than perceiving yes sorry shanti shanta means peaceful settled calm shanti is the state and shanta is the past participle shanti is peace and shanta is peaceful peaceful person will be shanta because he has shanti therefore he is shanta or because because she has shanti she will be called shanta long a shanta shanta when some when when a mother has evolved shanti then she will be called shanta and if a man has evolved shanti he will be called shanta <clears throat> so the full potential of the intellect is ev evolves only through the path of yoga what patanjali calls the truth bearing intellect ritambhara tatra prajna ritambhara prajna the truth bearing intellect the intellect that can carry infinite in itself an awareness of that infinite in itself that infinite truth in itself that is now one reason why the practice of yoga why yoga was seen so central 
to intellect by the masters of the Upanishads because for them the complete evolution, the complete development of human intellect comes about only through yoga. That's why they see yoga as the torso. That is one reason. And the second reason they give is that uh, all limbs function properly because of the torso. The torso controls. If the torso is weak and if the torso has no proper control, then the legs, the hands, nothing will function properly. So they say that a settled state of mind is the torso and all other means, all other means that a person can think of, they are like the limbs. They function properly only. You can speak about anything that you want, uh, non-violence, truthfulness, the yamas, the niyamas, purity, uh, compassion, contentment, asana, pranayama, all the other limbs that you want to speak about, all those limbs function properly in the sense that become capable of leading towards their goal only when the mind is completely settled. They have to be used as means to settle down the mind. Only then they truly become helpful. If the mind is agitated, if the mind remains restless, then there is a beautiful example that Krishna gives in the 18 verses, in the last 18 verses of uh, the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, which is really the quintessence of the Bhagavad Gita, the last 18, 18 verses of the second chapter. Mahatma Gandhi used to recite them every day in the evening as part of his prayer meaning. Because it's, it's Sthita Pradya Darshana, which means the description of someone whose mind has, has been settled whose mind has settled down, whose mind has become calm. The description of such a person. And there he says that <clears throat> Yes. When the mind follows the senses, then it gets, then the, the faculty of understanding gets carried away together with the mind. In the same way, like a ship gets carried away in the ocean through a strong gust of wind. When speaking in the context of the practice of pratyahara, which comes after pranayama, pratyahara, which means in which a, the yogi settles down the senses. There, uh, Madhusudan, a beautiful commentator of, on the Bhagavad Gita, he says that a strong current of wind can only carry away a ship as long as the ship is in the water, on unfirm ground. What usually um, fishermen do, that when they know that now a big cyclone is about to come, what they do is they take out their boats and park it on firm ground. And once they have parked their boats on firm ground, then however strong the gust of wind might be, it cannot carry them away. So the idea is that as long as the mind is agitated, as long as the mind is restless, till then the intellect will be carried away by the senses. But once the mind has settled down, 
once the mind has become peaceful once the mind has become still and that happens when first the body becomes still then when the breath becomes still then when the mind becomes still that is the practice of yoga then the intellect naturally settles then the intellect naturally settles down and it is then that all the practices that all the virtues that a practitioner of yoga has evolved as part of his practice that they start becoming truly meaningful so in that sense also yoga is the very torso in these two senses uh, the masters say that yoga atma yoga is the central body okay <clears throat> now let us come to the mantra that we had already pronounced in our previous session the first part of this mantra says that may my limbs speech life force which means prana eyes ears strength and all my senses thrive this is the first sentence of this mantra apyayantu apyayantu which i have translated as thrive means to be full from all sides round full fully developed vriddhi the sanskrit word vriddhi which means to evolve may they be fully evolved may their potential be fully developed that is what the word apyayantu means so that they can meditate and realize this inner essence that is the purpose because that is why in the next sentence he expresses the realization for which he wants his body to be strong he wants his limbs to be full to 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 be completely fully evolved developed mama mama means my and then angani angani means my limbs anga means limbs hand feet etc all these limbs <coughs> if we want to walk on this path which leads from the unreal into the real from death into immortality from the darkness of ignorance into the light of wisdom the first instrument that has been given to us is this physical body it's a beautiful uh, poet of india his name is kalidasa he is often uh, compared to shakespeare of sanskrit literature for the great plays and epics that he has composed and in one of his writings he says that sharira madhyam this physical body is the first instrument to develop righteousness it is the first instrument that we have so whatever a person wants to cultivate the body is the very first instrument and if the instrument is perfect if the instrument is strong if the instrument if the instrument's potential has been evolved completely to its totality then also the purpose the goal can be achieved that's why also in the parting message which is really like the quintessence of everything that the teacher has been teaching for 12 years because usually the courses in ancient india approximately lasted at least and i'm just saying at least for 12 years depending on how further uh, a student wants to study but 12 years was the 
shortest possible time, sometimes even 48 years, but 12 years was the standard. And after the student departed, at the moment when the student was departing, then the teacher used to give him the final teaching, which is really the quintessence of everything that he taught. And uh, it contains many beautiful sentences. One of them, so it comes in the Upanishads itself, it comes in, uh, in, in Taittiriya Upanishad, in the, towards the end of the first chapter of Taittiriya Upanishad. And one of the sentences there is, Kushalana Pramaditavyam, which means never be negligent towards your physical well-being. This is given to the student as a duty that he has to follow for the rest of his or her life. To never be negligent towards one's physical well-being. Which we easily, even though we love our body more than anything else, but we love its comforts more than our body. <laughs> Which means, when it comes between comforts and taking care of our body, we rather choose our comfort than the well-being and good health of our body. Comfort, what is pleasant, then, it, then, then we don't care, even if it is pleasant, even if it is harmful, if it is pleasant, we still do it. And we have all rational uh, explanations. Now, once I was giving a talk in uh, somewhere outside in Aloha, and uh, uh, there were, there were, this was a group of executives from Power Grid India, which means uh, those who take care of the electricity, uh, very high officers, a huge group of high officers. And uh, it was just by chance, I was, I was not talking about, I, I generally doesn't, don't talk about these things, but on that day I talked about uh, how we harm our body through wrong habits such as smoking and uh, and uh, drinking, etc. So I really talked about smoking and how it harms. And there were a few people in the group who seemed to be like chain smokers. <laughs> and they really started to argue and question against my views that oh, all kinds of rational explanations that why it should not be harmful. I said, okay, you win, I lose. <laughs> That's all what I can say. <laughs> but that is what we do sometimes, you know, just rationalize whatever we are doing and we become negligent. But may my limbs thrive, vak, the next one is vak, vak, speech. In fact, Saraswati, the goddess of knowledge, who is worshipped not only in India, but in most of South Asia, even for example in, uh, even though, for example, Indonesia is a country with a Muslim majority, and yet many of its schools, particularly in Java, they have beautiful statues of Saraswati there. Japan has its own form of Saraswati. Uh, in its ancient Buddhist culture. Saraswati as a goddess of science, as a goddess of wisdom, as a goddess of knowledge, as a goddess of arts, has evolved out of Vak, Vak Devi, the goddess of speech. So that's why sometimes Saraswati is referred to as Vak Devi. Vak Devi, which means the divinity residing, the, the radiance residing within a human speech. That is called Vak Devi Saraswati. So may Vak, my speech, because recitation and study, 
both is very difficult. Whether we, when we recite the mantras, when we recite mantras, we do so with the faculty of speech. In fact, if yoga asana is austerity on a physical level, then swadhyaya, which means chanting, is austerity on the level of speech. And critical analysis is austerity on the level of the mind. And that is why chanting has a very prominent place in all the traditions, in all the traditions that arose on the Indian subcontinent. Buddhists chant, Jainas chant, Sikhs chant, and all the traditions within Hinduism chant. Chanting is very much part of... Uh, there are two traditions. Some say that chanting without understanding is beneficial. Patanjali, etc. have the view that chanting becomes truly beneficial only when we understand the meaning of what we are chanting, of what we are repeating. That is the view of Patanjali, etc. But all this is possible, Swadhyaya, and even if we are just studying any kind of study, any kind of receiving of wisdom from a living person, relies on this faculty of speech. And that's why it ought to be developed. It ought to be purified. And that's why grammar of language is, has been given so much importance by Patanjali. Again, Patanjali, what do we recite every day? Yogena chittasya padena vacham. What Patanjali has done by being the greatest and most authoritative figure in Sanskrit grammar, he has given the scholars the supremely purified language, Sanskrit language, which is supremely purified in grammatically, linguistically. It's extremely logical. So he has removed the impurities of speech because if speech is not clear, if the words are not clear, then the thoughts will also not be clear. And if the thoughts are not clearly conveyed, then the listener, if the teacher himself has a confused understanding, then the listeners will also develop a confused understanding. So for the sake of clarity, even if through experience, a teacher has developed total clarity in his understanding. If the medium is not clear, if the medium is limited, then again the communion will be limited. And that's why there is so much importance given to evolve proper speech. And proper speech means not only grammatically correct, but also perfectly pronounced. And that's why in Sanskrit, and specifically in Sanskrit language, there is so much emphasis on pronouncing every word completely properly. Because meanings can change radically in Sanskrit language if you just pronounce, mispronounce a word. For example, there is this typical mistake that uh, people do today in India of mispronouncing sa, sha, and sha. These three letters, because they are so identical in Sanskrit, sa, sha, and sha. These three letters. Sa is in the teeth, sha is up here, and sha is down here. So the master says, child, learn to proper pronounce it. Otherwise, if one day somebody asks you, will your teacher 
have dinner, you will answer, he just eats once. He doesn't eat twice. A common, uh, pr a common uh, practice that was also uh, in ancient Buddhism, all the different traditions, they just eat once at meat. They just have a, have, a, have, a, have a lunch and they don't have dinner. So he says, oh, my, ma my master doesn't eat in the evening. He just eats once. So what you are supposed to say will be sakrid bhunte. He eats just once. But if you mispronounce it and you will say instead of sakrid bhunte, you will say shakrid bhunte. It means he eats excrement. Because sakrit means once and shakrit means human excrement. The tremendous difference. Same word, but just the difference between sa and sha. Sakrit. So you will, ah, oh, my teacher is so great. He, eat, he eats just once. And what the listener will hear, he will hear, my teacher is so great, he, he eats human excrement. And in the same way, there are like this, sakala. Sakala means complete. Complete, everything. And shakala means pieces. Pieces. Sakala means complete, and shakala means pieces so completely opposite or all my relatives will come today somebody is very proud and happy he's saying all my relatives are coming so he, instead of saying swajana agachanti which means my relatives are coming swajana means relatives my friends all my beloved ones are coming if he ends up saying swajana and shwa is adhomukha shvanasana shwa means dog <laughs> so then it will mean all my dogs are coming. <laughs> so like this in Sanskrit language, Vasudeva is the father and Vasudeva is the son. <laughs> Vasudeva is the father and Vasudeva is Krishna, the son. So like this in Sanskrit language, if the pronunciation is not proper, then it can lead to serious, serious misunderstandings. Just to give two, three examples. But the same, and that's why uh, the masters, uh, uh, in fact, shiksha, education, the Sanskrit word for education today. When we ask someone, is he educated? Is he shikshita? Then shiksha in ancient India simply me meant correct word pronunciation the capacity to pronounce the word correctly as it should be pronounced properly so that it doesn't lead to misunderstanding so the teachers when they were training the would-be teachers they were taking care of every aspect that the communion doesn't remain, th there should be no human limitation possible. Every human limitation should be avoided so that ultimately that truth can be, of course, it will ultimately then always be conditioned. The moment it is presented through a human mind, it it's what the human mind can do. It can only take pictures and present those pictures in words, but still, at least as clear as possible. That is the effort that the masters have put in it. And this is what this mantra reminds us. When, when the student prays that, may my speech thrive, may it be fully evolved. This is all that he or she had in their mind. And then comes prana. Me my prana. Prana. Again, there are several meanings of the word prana. First of all, this would be interesting because there is often a lot of confusion what prana really means in the context of 
pranayama what does prana stand for how do the yogic masters explain prana first of all this life force which animates any body which means any body and any and by any body i mean a human body as well as uh, an animal body and even tree body because there also for the masters prana is present in them wherever there is growth and there is expansion wherever there is growth wherever there is expansion there is for them the life force is present life force this prana is what makes it possible for something to expand so <clears throat> and this life force is not only equated to the wind yes it is a very important component but if you look at uh, the various upanishadic passages then of course yes prana is the wind within the human body but at the same time it also depends on the water that we consume so you will find for example sentences in the upanishads apu mayaha pranaha prana arises out of water and then there are also sentences which equated with heat with warmth within the human body and that is why to when we use the word prana in the sense of life force it is that life force which arises out of the interaction of water heat and wind air that life force that is called prana that is the first meaning of prana the life force functioning within this body which arises out of particularly out of these three elements heat wind air and water these three elements that life force which is also sometimes referred to as kriya shakti the potential to act shakti means potential and kriya because we have these two potentials the potential to know and of course the potential to will and also the potential to desire the potential because the process in the vedantic understanding is janati he knows then he desires and then he does he acts janati ichhati karoti he knows he desires and then he acts so these three powers these three potentials the potential to know the potential to desire and the potential to execute action the third one kriya shakti is dependent on prana it is pran it is related to prana the potential to act and then this prana this life force depending on the different functions that the masters have analyzed within the human body it is again then divided into the five pranas which are referred to as the five pranas the first one is in the yogic texts all the yogic texts particularly the hatha yoga texts speak of these five but the idea originates again in the upanishads because why this idea has come into the upanishads is because the aranyaka section the forest sections of the vedas which are more ancient than the vedas there what you find is simply worship and meditation of prana prana the life force of which all the different gods and goddesses that were being worshiped in rituals were seen as manifestations so in the moments of rituals there were many many different manifestations were being worshiped but when the masters come from the ritualistic stage into a meditative contemplative stage 
they choose the underlying principle of all the divinities in action and there then they start emphasizing on the only one divinity which is the which is the life force prana and that is where then the upanishads they start the aranyaka sections the forest sections are completely focused on meditative practices directed towards prana towards this life force present within the human body which is the animating principle within the human body and so the upanishadic experience of universal oneness evolves out of that prano pasana if you look at all the different uh, uh, upanishads you will always see that the section prior to them most in most cases the immediate section prior to the upanishads is about meditating on prana is about worshiping worship i'm just using an english word because in sanskrit the word for meditation and worship is the same but simply one is an external enactment of meditation and meditation is what we call meditation in english is just more internal worship and external worship is more external meditation but still we don't have two words upasana which simply which doesn't even mean worship it simply means to sit close asana uh, upasana upa means to sit close it simply means that to sit close to something that's all like when we meditate on patanjali we sit close to him and not only physically but mentally so for example when we fold our palms in the beginning of a class and we start reciting yogena chittasya padena vacham we are sitting close to patanjali we are generating that awareness of patanjali so we are approaching patanjali that is called upasana so in the same way the masters they and that's why the idea of prana is so central to the upanishads so now comes the five Uh, vrittis so the first one is referred to as prana again this is the and this is this gets sometimes confusing because on one side you have used the word prana for the life force and then it has five divisions and the first one which refers to this principle which flows as breath between the tip of the nose and the chest region the lungs so this continuous flow this too this is also referred to as prana so prana is also the life force per, uh, pervading the whole body for that also we use the word prana and also th- the part of it which is functional between the nose and the chest region the diaphragm whatever you want to call it that is also called prana and that which flows downward below the navel region and that's why presses out the impurities that is then called apana that which pushes out the impurities down below that is called so that that is the downward pressure that is referred to as apana vyana is diffused through the whole body and it enables the muscles to perform physically challenging tasks so the any physically challenging task that we do by strengthening our muscles which includes of course also the practice of yoga that depends tremendously on the vyana aspect of prana on the vyana aspect of prana which pervades all the different muscles all the different limbs of our body through which we perform the actions and the work of samana that aspect of prana that is the fourth samana samana is the fourth one the work of samana is to diffuse the um i don't know what is uh, 
um, there is a very technical word for the rasa, the juice that is extracted from the food by the intestine and then which gets diffused in the whole body through the blood. It's called in Sanskrit, it is called rasa, but I'm not remembering the English, uh, the technical word uh, for it. The work of samana is, in other words, the work of samana is to digest food and spread its, distribute the nourishment extracted from food into every part of the body. That is the work of samana. And then the last is udana. Udana is experienced as this heat within the body. The heat which we experience. And the more we act, the more hot we become. Udana gets strengthened. And then when it eventually leaves completely, then the body becomes completely cold. So that tejas aspect, that heat within the body. Remember prana, I said, is not only wind. It is three things. It is the result of three things. So the heat within the body is referred to as udana. So these are the five pranas, prana, apana, vyana, samana and udana. In each, if you see, just the prefix has been changed. Ana doesn't change. Ana means movement. Anagatau. It means movement. And it is in fact, uh, uh, um, it's, it, it comes from an extremely ancient Indo-European root from which Greek words such as animus and to animate in English have come. Exactly the same root, ana, animus, animate in English. It comes from there. And if you just change the prefixes, praana, prana, apaana, 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 sam, ana, samana, vi, ana, vyana, ud, ana, udana. That's all. Just the prefixes have been changed. So now remember, prana is the life force diffused in the entire human body. Prana is also this constant breathing in and out, that is, which means the human breath. That is also prana, the second meaning of prana. And within this, there is even a third prana which is sometimes the word prana is used in the sense of exhalation. And why is it so? Apana is the downward flow and prana is the upward flow. And when you inhale, when you are sitting in Padmasana and you inhale, what is the down, the downward, where is the downward flow? The downward flow is in inhalation. And that's why sometimes the word apana, now remember the meaning which I gave earlier to apana, which simply meant to push out the impurities. Forget that meaning now. Here it simply means downward movement. And because downward movement is there in inhalation, it is also referred to as apana. And in prana, there is upward, in exhalation, there is upward movement and that's why it is referred to as prana. So many times when prana and apana, these two words are used together in the yogic literature, then prana simply means exhalation and apana then would mean inhalation. So if you keep in mind these three meanings and usually the context, if the word prana is used on its own, usually it means to the all-diffusive life force. 
If it is used together with the other five, it simply refers to breathing. And if it is used together only with apana, then it is used in the sense of exhalation. So the context usually tells us. And I have seen, and I'm, why I'm spending so much time in explaining this, even though I did it earlier also, when, we, when the word prana came, but because even authors on the yogic texts, authors, and I'm really speaking of good authors, sometimes you find them getting confused which meaning to take. And they sort of create a mixture of all the three meanings without properly creating a very clear distinction which is there in a few places in the Sanskrit literature. If you cl clearly and carefully look at it, analyze it in the Upanishads and in the Hatha Yogic texts. So keep these three meanings of the word prana in your mind once again before we conclude. The omnipresent life force is prana. And not only the omnipresent life force in the body, but in fact the omnipresent life force everywhere. That is also called prana. But that's the fourth meaning. <laughs> so let us just remain limited to the body. So the, the life force that is diffused in the entire body, that is the first meaning. Then the breathing that takes place between the nose and the chest region, the diaphragm region, that is also called prana. And even within that, only exhalation is also sometimes called prana. So depending on the context, whenever we come to the word prana, then we have to decide which meaning to take. In this context, both are possible. Either you can, why shouldn't he strengthen the life force? So it can also mean all. If you, if you choose the meaning of life force, then all are included, or specifically also exhalation. Because again, chanting, teaching, everything is done with exhalation. And that's why exhalation, strengthening this exhalation, practicing rechaka pranayama is important from the perspective of this teacher. And that's why he says, pranaha, may my prana, may my breath, may my life force strive, may my breath, may my breathing become powerful and may my exhalation so that I can, and if you, uh, listen to some of the, uh, those who chant, who really have been trained in chanting, in Vedic chanting properly, they have a very strong, uh, sometimes uh, the, the, the typical uh, uh, analogy that we give in Sanskrit, to roar like um, a, a bull. <laughs> that is usually the, the example, because in, in the Vedas we have Vrishabho Roraviti, Vrishabha, the bull roars, you know, so that example is given, the sound becomes very deep and the breath becomes very strong th with the practice of chanting and very balanced and very deep. So that is also what is included in strengthening prana. Then, of course, eyes, ears, chakshuhu, shrotram, through the eyes we see, through the ears we listen. These are also important faculties to receive knowledge, to understand, to hear, to listen, and to observe. Both is extremely important. To listen, when we listen, we receive second-hand knowledge, and when we observe with our eyes, we receive first-hand knowledge. And that's why these two senses are also extremely important. We'll continue this mantra. Let us leave it today. Any questions? Anything that you would like me to clarify? Yes? Vyana means that which is diffused throughout the body. And that's why it is that 
that that part of prana which enables us to do heavy work that is called dhyana so this is dhyana the strength that we then create in our muscles that is the action of dhyana that aspect of prana remember these five are just aspects of one prana depending on the different actions that prana does it is the same prana but depending like the same person depending on the actions that that person performs we give a different designation the same person is in the kitchen she is a cook uh, from the perspective of the child she is the mother from from the perspective in her office she is the manager so all the different designations the person is the same but just different designation when she is driving her car to the office she is a driver then she is referred to as a driver you know so depending on the role that she is playing different designations are given yet the person is the same in the same way prana apana vyana samana and udana they are just different designations of the same life force functional functioning within the human body so the when prana enables that aspect of prana which enables us to do strong work that aspect is called dhyana any other sorry in plants in plants yes also there to a great extent maybe not all of them maybe not maybe i don't know it would be very interesting to prana is certainly there that one life force is certainly there whether all the five vrittis all the five modifications actually get manifested there that that has to then be scientifically analyzed i mean the fact that uh, a plant can break through the stone what tremendous strength a plant can have you know through its roots slowly and gradually it can in fact uh, it can it can uh, it can destroy this house because it can really with its roots so there is tremendous strength in there so vyana somehow is there prana some breathing is certainly there apana it too has to get rid of its impurities in whatever way because if it burns energy then impurity is created and it has to get rid of it so apana is there prana apana vyana samana 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 diffusion of course nourishment diffuses in all the different parts and limbs udana now uh in the plants and everything i don't know even in cold blooded creatures i don't know how to find udana there <laughs> so but at least in warm blooded creatures it is certainly there it would be interesting how do cold blooded creatures uh show up themselves on thermal cameras that would be interesting i think to see whether i think some heat is do they show up completely cold okay i would be interesting to see how they show up in thermal color in any case they need heat and that's why they come out they bathe in the sun and they imbibe heat even if if uh, if if that aspect is not clearly present in their blood still they have to take it from the sun so that aspect of prana is still important in them so somehow i would say that all the five aspects are there yes yes udana would also be there yes 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 that uh, that has to be yeah i mean that's why i said it has to be uh, understood what uh, of course the masters they say very clearly that prana is everywhere uh, undoubtedly so yes so that's that's a that's an argument that if digestion is there 
then some kind of heat as a result of there must be there. That's why I had that thermal image, whether there it shows up as heat or not, that would be interesting. In any case, they need it, that is undoubtedly there. And every creature has to breathe in and has to breathe out. That is undoubtedly there. In whatever way they do, even fish in water has to breathe in water and then from the gills it breathes it out. So that's part of life circle. <clears throat> okay. So let us conclude with the prayer for universal well-being. Sarve bhavantu sukhinaha, sarve santu niramayaha, sarve bhadrani pashyantu, makaschid dukha bhag bhavet, om shantihi, shantihi, shantihi. My humble salutations to you. Thank you very much. <coughs>